Good morning everyone and welcome to our Sabbath School Lesson Review. Our Father in Heaven this morning, we pray for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our thoughts that we may synthesize the whole thing and see it clearly so we can apply it for our Christian living. For I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Jesus and the Apostles' view of the Bible. We said that this study of the Bible this week, in a sense, is actually a defense in favor of the Old Testament Bible because there are so many philosophies today which are destructive in as far as the Bible validity is concerned. One of those philosophies is the postmodernism, which states that they don't need external standards. What they need is themselves as the final arbiter. And the other one is evolution. This view rejects the teachings of the Bible. And so our study this week has presented in details in what sense the Old Testament still valid until today. So last Sunday, we discussed how Jesus used the scriptures when he was tempted by the devil himself. The mission of the devil is to lead Jesus to sin so that he would be disqualified to be the savior of men. And so he prepared the most effective, tested, and proven temptation so that the savior of men may yield to it and be disqualified to be the savior of men. And so he said, if you were the son of God, turn the stone into bread. Here in this temptation, Satan was insinuating, commanding Jesus to use his divine power for his own self. We made it clear that Jesus never used his divine power for his own self. He used his divine power by making, performing miracles for the good of other people. So you see here, the area where Jesus would sin had he yielded to the temptation is in the area of selfishness. And the defense of Jesus Christ is the scripture. And the scripture we are referring to is none other than the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Many Christians no more with the Old Testament. Remember, Jesus used the Old Testament as a defense against Satan's temptation. Number two, since Satan failed in the first temptation, he now comes to the second temptation through the self down. And we said this is the sin of presumption. And we differentiated between faith and presumption. Faith claims the promise of God and then obey the requirements of God. Presumption starts with the promise of God but leads to disobedience. That's presumption and we have given examples of that. For example, we have been assured that Jesus would protect us from COVID-19 but if you go out and then meet somebody because you claim the promise of God's protection, that is presumption. And so Jesus defended himself by quoting the scriptures with the formula, it is written, thou shalt not tempt or test the Lord thy God. And so he came to the last uh, temptation of Satan. Jesus was shown the kingdoms of the world and all the things that attract many and all people there, okay, in the area of materialism. And Jesus said, it is written, worship God only. And so in this study, it's very clear that Jesus has given us a model that human beings, sinful as we are, can overcome temptations and can live a victorious life because of the victory of Jesus Christ that we can claim, that we can depend upon the scriptures, we can depend upon the power of God to overcome temptations. Our problem is we do not exert efforts to overcome temptations. Okay, so that is the special doctrine. We can live a sinless, victorious life through Jesus Christ, His power and His grace. Let's go to the second topic we discussed, Jesus and the law. This is the most controversial of all the topics that we face nowadays because many people called the antinomians, those who are against the law, they claim and they said that the law of God in the Old Testament is difficult and that is obsolete. We now just follow the New Testament. The New Testament is easy. It's just love. But in our study this week, we provided you biblical text in the Gospels that reflect all the Ten Commandments 
from commandment 1 until commandment 10. Okay, so you have there also the Old Testament law and in between in the red you have the, the New Testament law found in the Gospels and then the last column there are the principles behind the law. Okay, so let's just review quickly law number one, no other gods is found in Matthew, Mark and also including Luke. There is one Lord and one God. Okay, the principle is loyalty. Number two, no graven image found in Matthew in John, uh, John chapter 4 worship him only the principle is worship nothing in between he defines how we should worship him okay number three no using his name in vain jesus taught in matthew 6 found also in luke 11 in john 17 hallowed be your name the principle of reverence and number four commandment keep the sabbath holy so many texts about jesus but this one actually mark chapter 2 not 21 but chapter Chapter 2 verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man. And Jesus demonstrated that the proper way of keeping the Sabbath is not just worshiping in the church but doing good for other people on Sabbath day. And he said that doing good is in favor of the law. These four commandments Jesus said in Matthew 22:37 and 38 that all the law hung on this. For this is the first and the greatest commandment loving God. In other words, our number one value in this world is God. Okay? The second greatest commandment according to the teachings of Jesus is like unto that, love your neighbor. You see, so to summarize it is just love. What these people who are against the law do not want to look into is that this love has details and they are all found in the Ten Commandments. So let's go to the second bus, honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus quoted it verbatimly in Mark, Luke, and Mark 7.10. Okay, so honor thy father and thy mother. No mistake there. The principle there is respect for authorities. You see, loving our fellow men begins at home. Okay, the way we treated, the way we learn respect from parents would reflect the way we respect other authorities. Thou shalt not kill was verbatimly quoted by Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 22, Mark, and then Luke. The principle there is preserving life. We said that this one is very relevant because of the restricting us to stay home because it belongs to the principle of preserving life. So stay home, that's why we are still in the home, keeping the Sabbath holy. Number seven commandment, do not commit adultery, verbatimly quoted by Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, 27, 28, and then Mark 10, 19. The principle here is purity. So that governs relationships between husband and wife, including single men and women. Because in the teachings of Jesus, sin begins in the thought. And once we entertain impure thoughts or violate the principle of purity. Thou shalt not steal was also verbatimly quoted by Jesus Christ, Matthew 5, 19, 20, and so on and so forth. Okay? The principle is respect, properties, or honesty, to be short. Number nine is not bear false weakness. Witness, verbatimly quoted by Jesus Christ in Mark 10, Matthew 5, and Luke 18. The principle in the law is truthfulness. God wanted His people to be truthful. Okay? And the last of the commandment, number 10, is thou shalt not covet. And Jesus in Luke 12, Matthew 16, and Mark 4, quoted the word covetousness by saying, beware of covetousness. So we see here that the principle is contentment. It's very clear in this presentation that the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament are all found in the Gospels. So there is no excuse, it's false to say that the Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament, the New Testament is just love. Yes, it's correct, it's love, but the details of how to love God and how to love men are all there. Next topic that we discuss is Jesus and all Scripture. The basis of this topic is the experience of Jesus walking along with His disciples on that resurrection after 
afternoon when Jesus walked with them from Jerusalem going to Emmaus. These people were sad, they were disappointed, they were they were not happy because of the death of their Savior Jesus Christ. And He came to them on the resurrection day to explain to them the scriptures. It's noteworthy how Jesus explained the scriptures. In our study, we are, we are told in Luke 24-27 that Jesus used all scriptures He quoted from Moses to the last book of the scripture to explain one important topic. And that is the model of interpretation that we're following. In every topic, we ask the Bible to explain itself. It's like research, the concept of research. Let's say you research on COVID-19. You gather all the documents, all the reports, everything that talks about that particular topic. And then we make conclusion. That principle is in the Bible. Jesus used that one topic, all scripture. Okay? So that's the principle. And there was a target of the exposition of Jesus Christ, none other than the disciples. And the outcomes of the exposition or the explanation of Jesus Christ was that they burned their hearts with joy. And immediately when they discovered it was Jesus Christ who was risen, that very night they returned to Jerusalem to share the good news. You see, this is a very nice model of interpretation and evangelism. We use the whole scriptures or the totality of the scripture to explain one particular topic, explain it to people, and the result would be joy and happiness. Okay, and we said that this is the same model we use by Seventh-day Adventists. We use all the scriptures, the totality, to explain each doctrine of the church taken from the Bible. The 28 fundamental doctrines in our target group are all the peoples around the world based from Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And the outcomes that we expect when we present this fundamental doctrine or teachings of the church is baptism and that Jesus wanted all people to keep all these teachings found in the scriptures. We go to the next, Jesus and the origin and history of the Bible. We made it very clear that the history that these antinomians reject as valid, okay, is that prime mover of this history in the Old Testament is none other than God. And that people in the Old Testament, places and events are real and historical truth. Therefore, they are considered as if it's God speaking to them through the experiences of these people found in these places and events. So we have there in the middle column, the green column there, I have provided you their cases in which Jesus quoted the Old Testament scriptures. Number one is divorce. He quoted it from Genesis 1 and 2, okay? And then murder of Abel and Zechariah from Genesis chapter 4. And then the sermon on the Beatitudes where Jesus was talking about persecution. He referred to the persecution of the prophets in history. Therefore, Jesus recognized this history in the Old Testament are real and authoritative and therefore they are God's word. Another, we cited David ate the bread which was against the law but it was allowed because he was hungry. In the same manner, Jesus used that history of David to defend himself from his enemies by saying that it is also lawful to allow his disciples to eat on Sabbath day because they were subscribing to the higher value that is preserving life. Another example there is that in Luke 4, 25 to 27, Jesus quoted the history of Elijah, widow, the famine, and Naaman there. This history to Jesus Christ was valid and authoritative. Jesus was rejected in Nazareth and he was quoting this history because in the history in the past, God has rejected his people by not sending Elijah to the Jews, but he sent Elijah to a widow. In a sense, that was an insult to them. And he was telling that at the time of Elijah, there were Israelites who were lepers, but God did not heal them. Instead, God healed a Gentile captive. Naaman that enraged the religious leaders and they wanted to kill Jesus Christ. The point here is that Jesus recognized these histories are real and he used that in his teachings in his sermons. That is the point here. Okay, the last one there is that Jesus also used Genesis chapter 6 and 7 the event, the history, the judgment of God against the world at the time of Noah. Jesus was saying these events act 
appointed by God Himself will come again or will happen again in the last days when Jesus Christ would come. So thus, the origin of the history is God Himself and these people and places are real. They are therefore God's word and authoritative for us. So thus, Jesus and the history and origin of the Bible. Okay, we also studied that the apostles of Jesus Christ have done the same thing with the Master, with Jesus Christ. They also quoted the Old Testament scriptures because it's logical there was no New Testament yet at the time. Their only scripture was the Old Testament. So we are provided here with examples about how the New Testament believers and the apostles use the scripture. Number one example there is the believers praise. When the apostle Peter and other apostles were detained, okay, were arrested, the religious leaders met and then decided what to do with the apostles okay, who keep on preaching in the name of Christ. And so the religious leaders influenced by the majority of the people who really like the preaching they release Peter and the apostles. When the believers knew what the religious leaders did, they praised the Lord. And part of their praise was the quotation from Psalms chapter 2, 1 and 2, where it says, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? That therefore a prophecy fulfilled in their time. Okay. Another example was Paul who actually summarized or paraphrased the long history of uh, the Jews. And then he started it from Abraham to Canaan, from Egypt to the wilderness, from the wilderness to Canaan, and all the kings there until Paul came to the history of Jesus Christ. And he was telling his audience that this Jesus, whom they crucified, is none other than the Son of God. So he quoted Psalms chapter 2 verse 7. And another example there is Romans 9 17. Paul was talking about the sovereignty, the power of God, that he even raised Pharaoh for a purpose. And that purpose is none other than to proclaim the name of God all throughout the earth. God is really powerful and we can trust His power. He can help us go through with the crisis. Okay, and the last there that we have discussed is the quotation of Paul on righteousness by faith in Galatians 3 verse 8, quoted from Genesis 22 verse 18, in which Abraham had been promised by the Lord that his descendants will be a blessing to all nations. And that blessing would come not because they are the literal children of Israel, but they would receive the promise by faith. And all the nations of the earth will be blessed by faith, not by the law, not by good works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul was saying not all Israel are Israel. Okay, All those who have faith like Abraham, will become ears of Abraham. Righteousness by faith was the doctrine that God has revealed to Paul and all and many Jews, including the disciples of Christ, were able to accept this new revolutionary doctrine revealed to him. Okay, and uh, last night, I have provided you details on the life of Jesus Christ as a child. And we said that in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom, he increased in stature, he increased in favor with men and he increased in favor with God. So we look at these principles in a broader perspective. There is one word that I'd like to connect ourselves today with Jesus Christ in all the study this week. And that word is taken that I'm borrowing from Desire of Ages. Okay? That word is diligence. Ellen White described Jesus as a child who was diligent in the study of the scriptures. And so I like to phrase these uh, reflections like this, like Jesus and the apostles, I diligently search the scriptures. Let's reflect on this and I hope you respond to that individually and our goal is for us to be like Jesus, diligent in searching the scriptures. Our problem is diligence because so many activities, so many work to do, we do not have time aside from being busy, our attitude of being in the land. Okay, so here I I am not at all diligent in searching the scriptures. Number two, I am slightly diligent in searching the scriptures. Number three, I am somewhat diligent in searching the scriptures. Like Jesus, I am moderately diligent in searching the scriptures. 
And number five, I'm extremely diligent in scriptures like Jesus Christ in the apostles. They regarded the scriptures as their number one priority. They regarded it as life. They regarded it as the number one book in their lives. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Just like Jesus in the apostles' view of the scriptures, we have given it topmost importance. Help us that we may do the same and find time and be diligent in the study of the scriptures that would prepare us for the future and for your second coming. Help us that our understanding of the scriptures may be able to share it to our fellow men, that they too may be prepared for your coming kingdom. Because I pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring.